theatre land, London's West End. One square mile of musical talent worth over a quarter of a billion pounds a year. One of the cultural epicentres of Great Britain and the world. But it wasn't always this way. 65 years ago, the West End was parochial, trapped in a time warp of pre-war nostalgia, completely unprepared for a new breed of musical emerging from America. This is the story of the rise of the British musical. How the British fought back against American domination to not only reclaim the West End, but to become a driving force behind musical theatre around the world, turning it into a global industry worth over one and a half billion pounds a year. It's a tale of titanic shows. Half of it wasn't written, and the bits that had been written were far too long. Nobody in our team had done it before, except for me. This was a sort of a musical phenomena. A story of prodigious talent. All the talent that was being invented were all in Britain. We just thought, this is working quite well. And that was the day my life changed forever. And phenomenal daring. After the reviews, our box office was, was shredded. They got to see some ass. They took him off screaming, we never saw him again. That's how difficult that show is. At the end of World War II, the West End musical, cut off from outside influences for six long years, was looking tired. The musicals of one-time giants Ivan Novello and Noel Coward, with their polite tales of romance, were feeling as out of date as their Victorian settings. And in 1947, London found itself under a new bombardment, a wave of American musicals, quite different from anything any British audience had ever seen before. I remember when Oklahoma came over, it, it had a terrific effect on us. The home up where the wind comes sweeping down the plain. I was just knocked out, absolutely knocked out, breathless. When the wind comes right behind the rain. It was just wallop on, you know, Oklahoma, and you, wow, and the, and the energy of it sort of took your breath away. It was the first time after the sort of dreary years of what was going on in the war where a, a, a vibrant new musical had opened in London and it was a burst of sunshine. And when we say, no, I ain't by a In its choreography, lighting, even its cowboy setting, Oklahoma was light years away from what the British were doing. But its most revolutionary aspect was the way it seamlessly stitched dance, song and dialogue into a dramatic whole. The dances and the songs were all part of the show, which was unusual. In the, in the old days, the songs just came in for no reason at all. But they were, it was all a, a whole, you know, integrated. The Americans had arrived. Powerhouses like Rogers and Hammerstein, Irving Berlin and Lerner and Lowe. The Americans had so many great writers in full swing. They just came one after the other, you know. It was marvellous. The Americans were in the ascendance. Unable to rival them, British composers came up with breezier, small-scale musicals like Salad Days and The Boyfriend. Curiosities, quite different from the loud, flashy shows coming from Broadway. I never felt that I could really write that sort of show. And in fact, the writing The Boyfriend was in direct contrast. It was very old-fashioned. It was an old-fashioned 1920s musical. <laughs> The 
boyfriend story of love on the French Riviera was inspired by the dance crazes of the Roaring Twenties. With Britain in the grip of a revival of those happier pre-war years, the boyfriend became a rare British musical success. I think it was the timing was right. We'd had so many American musicals, and then suddenly the boyfriend, it was so simple, and it was not sophisticated at all, and the music was pretty, the lyrics were lovely. I could be happy with you If you could be happy with me It was thrilling, really. Because somehow in my childhood, I'd always imagined that I would write a, a musical comedy that would be a hit on the West End, and it actually happened with the first show I wrote. <laughs> The boyfriend's use of 1920s American dance music made it an appealing prospect to Broadway producers. In 1954, it became the first post-war musical to go against the tide and transfer to New York. I drank Manhattans. I ate hamburgers. I went to Macy's and Bloomingdale's. <laughs> that was the culture for me. It was like an Aladdin's cave, to tell the truth, coming from not war-torn Britain, but we were a bit deprived here. The American producers on Broadway were Cy Fewer and Ernie Martin, showmen, whose latest blockbuster, Guys and Dolls, was an altogether more show-busy affair than the intimate period piece that was The Boyfriend. They were very charming to begin with, but not for long. They were brutes. They were determined to make it a hit, come what may. They suddenly turned on us and said, get out. In fact, I was literally picked up and flung out onto the sidewalk. Yeah. And we weren't allowed in at all until the first night. And by that time, they had done a lot of damage. They turned it into a burlesque. <laughs> Only by hamming up the boyfriend for cheap laughs did the American producers believe it could be a Broadway hit. If the British were ever to find success in America on their own terms, a radical rethink in musical theatre would have to happen. By the late 1950s, the seeds of that revolution were beginning to be sown. Not in West End's theatre land, but in the socially deprived East End, and the politically radical Stratford East Theatre Workshop. At present, the company are working on a new musical about the Soho underworld, under their director, Joan Littlewood. Joan Littlewood was probably the most important uh, theatre director in Britain in the second half of the 20th century. She sort of reinvented theatre. She got completely fed up of this notion that theatre was posh people. She allowed you to be yourself. I mean, I was a working class, lower class girl, and I was forced to be middle class by the theatre of the day, because that's what you did. You, you spoke nice, and you looked pretty, and you weren't tall, so I always wore flat shoes, and, you know, you conformed. And Joan suddenly threw all that aside. Just come here, they expect to have a calm day, and what happens? They look around, what do they see? You, and your bleeding birds, and him, lying about all over the place, so they have it off to that bleeding French is down the road. Yeah. She actually directed shows in a way that they'd never been directed before. She improvised scenes with the actors. Scripts were built up through the process of improvisation with actors. Everybody threw in their two pennies. And she always had music in her plays because it seemed right and proper that people would burst into song. So I don't think she distinguished between a musical and a play. She was a total original, Joan. <laughs> While Littlewood was transforming theatre, a revolution was happening in the world of popular music. Rock and roll was the sound of a new generation, and a young East End Jewish songwriter named Lionel Bart was making a name for himself, penning hits for the likes of Cliff Richard and Tommy Steele. I met him about two o'clock in the morning at a party that I'd been invited to uh, in a bombed ruin next door to Waterloo Station. And there was this fella wearing a big picture hat 
a big feather boa and one of those oil lamps, swinging it around his head, singing There Ain't Nothing Like a Dame. And it was Lionel. Crazy. Mad. Absolutely potty. But brilliant. <laughs> In 1959, Joan Littlewood asked Bart to add music and lyrics to Things Ain't What They Used To Be, a comedy about the Soho criminal underworld. The meeting of two mavericks would have lasting consequences for the British musical. Lionel loved working on his feet and he loved working with other people. Joan would say, uh, we need another song here. Uh, what about, uh, about um, this guy comes on? OK. And he'd go away. And he loved that show-off thing of being able... Hey, yeah, there's the song. And it was brilliant. Fing's story of bent coppers, spivs and prostitutes became a surprise hit. Publicity was helped with a spin-off single by Max Bygraves. Oi! Do me a fighter! They've changed our local tally into a bowling alley and things ain't what they used to be. Now, if you listen to that, you get no indication at all of what the show is about because the words were completely rewritten. The original words for things are entirely different from the Max Bygraves version and the BBC could not in a million years play it. There's toughs with toffee noses and puffs in coffee houses and things ain't what they used to be. There's short-time, low-priced mysteries without proper histories. Things ain't what they used to be. And he says, how they used to be class, doing a town, buying a bit of vice. She says, and that's when a brass couldn't go down. Under the union price, not likely once in golden days of yore. Ponces killed a lazy whore. Things ain't what they used to be. You want a second chorus? <laughs> With its subject matter and language, Fings was a direct challenge to the office of the Lord Chamberlain, which for over 200 years had been the country's official theatre censor. The interior decorator, Wallace Eaton, carrying a ladder. The censorship man said that you mustn't carry the ladder in a sort of semi-vertical position because that's suggestive. The night he came in, it was carried at an erotic angle, and he wasn't standing for that. He wanted a lot of the words taken out. Nobody took any notice of him at all, because the show was improvised, semi-improvised, so they just make up new stuff. With things, the British musical seemed to be finding its feet. But the Americans had already unleashed yet another game-changing blockbuster. Overriding the whole of the musical theatre from the late 50s to the early 60s was West Side Story, which was just such an overpowering achievement. Everybody just watched it with open mouths and said, how the hell do you do that? West Side Story's update of Romeo and Juliet using rival ethnic street gangs left audiences shocked. Never before had a musical attempted such adult themes and tied it together with a bristling soundtrack and electrifying choreography. And no one knew what to do. The musical had come to a stop. Killed by genius. Bernstein's genius stopped them knowing where they were going to go next. So along comes Lionel Bart, an ordinary cockney boy from the East End with salt beef and a pickle, and he goes back to his Cockney roots. What Lionel did, instead of trying to leap over the bar, he limboed under it and came in with this Dickens story that had British tunes in it. He didn't try and do that American jazzy stuff to equal West Side Story. He did these knees up. Ah, uh, you know, you, you cannot listen to Oliver without doing that. Come, sit to yourself. <laughs> Like Bernstein, Bart had written a musical about street gangs, but this was a very British story set in the seedy underbelly of Dickens' London. 
Much of the success of the show would depend on how well Fagin, the evil gang leader of the novel, could be turned into a more sympathetic figure for the West End stage. Auditioning for the part was actor Ron Moody. For the first audition, they said, now what about singing? So I said, um, well, I can do... He got the part and he invented the part. I mean, there's no going away from that, that everybody who's ever played Fagin since, there is always that reference point. Uh, that you are referring to Ron Moody. When I see someone rich, both my thumbs start to itch, only to find some peace of mind, I have to pick a pocket or two, you got to pick a pocket or two. You've got to pick a pocket or two. Even with the brilliance of Moody as Fagin, at its stage premiere in June 1960, Bart wasn't convinced that Oliver could be a success. Lionel Bart was so convinced that it was a flop that he went down the road to, to um, Barbara Windsor's dressing room. Uh, where he spent most of the show because Things Ain't What They Used To Be was on there and came back and heard this braying noise and thought he was being booed. Donald Aubrey, who was the producer, was, where the hell have you been? Come with me. And they basically pushed him on stage. By this time, they'd taken 23 curtain calls, not just curtain calls, but reprises of Consider Yourself. They'd sung that song 23 times. The cast were hoarse. The audience wasn't going to go home. And Wolf, that was it. He was the master, suddenly. It wasn't just Lana Bart anymore, it was a big thing. On river, on river, never before has a boy wanted more. On what made Bart's success all the more extraordinary was that he couldn't actually read or write music. He was full of ideas, but nothing was, there was no, didn't hand you a piece of paper saying that they were, there's the plan. And so it, the tunes came to him. Da 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 da. Get a, and yeah, it's a little tune. Somebody would write it down. It's this E flat, see? I'll see you again. I always think it must be very difficult to write both words and music, if only because you haven't got somebody else telling you where you're going wrong. Bring so Lana Bart was a significant talent. He really was. Either your piano is out of tune, or you've got cloth ears, mate. <laughs> You see, that's why the, his talent went through him like that, because he didn't think, well, what did I have to do with it? All I did was invent the tunes, but they were marvellous. Three years after its London premiere, Oliver launched on Broadway to critical and commercial acclaim. Britain finally had a genuine international hit, free from American meddling. It was the start of a boom time for Brits on Broadway, and Bart was at its head. Just over the road from where Oliver opened, Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, Alan Bennett and Jonathan Miller were appearing in Beyond the Fringe. Just down the road, a few blocks away, Tony Newley was in Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. These shows were hits. More significant still, when Oliver opened, number one in the American hit parade was Telstar by the Tornadoes. <laughs> A British invasion which has been going on since last autumn. The invasion of Broadway. So this notion that the Beatles brought Britain to America, bollocks. Lionel did it. Lionel and Tony Newley and Joe Meek and the Tornadoes. They, they made that, that British revolution happen. And so uh, Oliver's Britishness was what the Americans loved. If I rule 